sorry, technical hitch. Now, about two years ago, I saw a video on the YouTube channel of Channel News Asia's Insider. I don't know if some of you may have uh, we watch, you watch that, okay? Yes. So, some of you may actually have seen the documentary that was entitled Get Going Hungry in Singapore. Going Hungry in Singapore. And uh, this was a documentary that I think was very informative, at least for me. And it said that Singapore is famous for cheap hawker food. But it also said that hunger and food insecurity exists in our city state. Wealthy though it seems we may be, but there is still hunger, there is still food insecurity in Singapore. And here, food insecurity actually is talking about um, the lack of a reliable access to nutritious food due to financial constraints. Long and short is to say, no money to buy food. Lah. Okay? So we do have individuals, people, families in Singapore who cannot afford to buy food. And so it was an eye-opening report for me um, it also became a springboard where the Lord increasingly uh, showed me from His Word His unrelenting love for the broken, the outcast, the forgotten. What I hope to do today uh, for us in our time together is that out of God's Word and through story, we will be able to catch a glimpse of the care that the Lord has for the least of these. And I hope um, for those of you who are at home, uh, you will just follow along with us as well. So today's text, today's text, uh, Bible text from the book of Deuteronomy uh, is one text that actually has shaped some of my thinking. It addresses, I believe, both the Christian's role and the church's role in caring for the poor whether they be fatherless, whether they be widow, or whether they be stranger or foreigner. So please allow me to read from God's Word, from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 through 19. Actually, verse 18 is the focal verse, um, but I sandwiched, uh, put a couple more, more verses and put it there so that we would have a bit more context rather than just one verse. So but allow me to read from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 17 through 19. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore... Love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come now to open your word, we ask, Lord, for the presence of your spirit. We ask that you speak to us, that you exhort, you encourage, and for those of us who need comfort, you comfort us that we might better know you and know afresh your heart for us as individuals and also for those around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we think upon the Bible passage which we read just now, allow me to give a bit of backdrop. Now, some of you might know Deuteronomy um, is credited uh, to be written by Moses and so Moses, who was delivering his farewell addresses, and they compiled his farewell addresses as seen in Deuteronomy, and uh, he was in this process of transferring the leadership of the nation of Israel to Joshua. As he was writing, though, he remembered the covenant love relationship that he had, God, that God had, with his people. So Moses remembered God's covenant love for his people. And Moses' dying desire was that the people that he poured his life into would know God spiritually, they would know God inwardly, they would know God externally, and one day they would know God eternally. 
But here's the thing. Moses also knew the people. He had, after all, been leading them, walking through the wilderness with them. And he knew that these people have stubborn hearts. They have unresponsive hearts. It's like that there is a hard shell around the heart that does not allow the person to move toward God. And Moses knew that something must change within. And so here's the first thing I believe that can possibly have been on Moses' mind when he, out of the text that he wrote. And the first thing that uh, Moses put to the people was the call to recognize who God is. God is worthy of worship. He is worthy of praise. He is worthy of our love and devotion because He is supreme. You can see it in the Bible text. Um, the, the Bible text actually tells us He is supreme, God of gods, Lord of lords. And the titles of God are always important. The title God refers to God's overarching, overall power, His transcendence, His majesty. Whereas Lord refers to God's ownership, His sovereignty over all of His creation. Moses thus is trying to identify God as infinite, as unique, as supreme. The supreme one who has absolute dominion and power over the entire universe. He is awesome, the great, the mighty, the awe-inspiring, worthy, he is worthy of honour and glory. He is awesome. He is integrity, does not show partiality. He does not show favouritism. He deals with all men the same way. He deals with all women the same way. He is not corrupt. He does not bribe and cannot be bribed. So don't think that we can manipulate the living God to action. It is interesting though that the appeal to care like God cares, to do that, the, if you read the Bible text, administering justice for the fatherless and the widow and loving the stranger. Now, if you look at the, the Bible text, if, so for those of you who have Bibles, if you look at chapter 10, Deuteronomy 10, verse 12, and Deuteronomy 10, verse 20, it's kind of like that verse, that, that thing about um, caring, like God cares, administering justice to the fatherless and to the widow and, the, and loving the stranger. It is actually sandwiched between a command. And that command is this, fear the Lord, fear the Lord. Almost as if Moses were trying to say that you and I are able to truly care the God way, that we truly are able to care the theocentric way, the God-centered way. It's only possible is if we fear, we truly fear the Lord. Only when you reverence Him, only when His rule, His reign is in your life, his king, then His kingdom comes. His will is done in your life. His will is done through your life, even as you carry His kingdom within you to others. Some years back, Paula Fuller tells the story of Hurricane Katrina. Now, Hurricane Katrina ravaged the Gulf Coast and it also the, collapsed the whole levee system in the New Orleans area. The whole system, the New Orleans area in the United States, the whole levee system failed. She and many others had spent hours shocked and reeling from the video footage of New Orleans with images of residents clinging for dear life to the rooftops, trying to wade through flooded sections, hoping they wouldn't drown, she felt uh, the country really, they were in this predicament because they were not prepared for the convergence of a host of issues that had not been addressed. And some of the host of issues that had not been addressed or properly addressed was Poor city planning. Something else, inadequate crisis response system. 
Then there was racially segregated neighbourhoods and economic poverty. All of it came together and caused the... It wasn't just the flood, it, but all of these together with the flood was totally devastating. And why she talks about racially segregated neighbourhoods and economic poverty, it was really because a lot of the people that were affected, a lot of the people whose properties were damaged, whose lives were destroyed, were really from African-American background. And it was at a prayer meeting thereafter, she recalled being also the only African-American attending and how, as she remembered the faces of the people she had seen earlier that day, she began to sob quietly at first. But then it grew, the sobs grew with intensity. And she came to realise that whatever was produced in their time together that day really had to address the pain, the brokenness and despair of the people she saw on that day. And she said, if we fail, if we fail to do this, to create a model that is relevant to those who have experienced such severe suffering and displacement, then she said, our message is missing something that was central to the gospel message that Jesus preached. She says, the people of New Orleans and the displaced residents needed more than the proclamation of the kingdom of God, important as the kingdom of God is, what they needed, what they really needed in a time like this was a demonstration, not just proclamation, but demonstration of the kingdom of God. And beyond this, the victims of Hurricane Katrina needed to experience the presence of the kingdom of God in that encounter. For Paula, it was a transforming moment as she struggled to grasp what it means to have the kingdom of God present and available for those in need both of spiritual salvation but as well as spirit, physical salvation. And she says, it wasn't good, it isn't good enough for them to hear that God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their eternal salvation, important as all that is. The majority of the individuals whose lives were totally destroyed and wrecked by Hurricane Katrina were not questioning whether or not there was a God. They were wondering why God had allowed such a devastating set of circumstances to happen. They were wondering, does God actually care about their current situation and condition? And what is He going to do about all of this? Now, some of you are going to sit here and be wondering, why are we talking about an American story and what relevance has this got to do with us here in Singapore? Can I suggest the relevant point for us today, that it should not take, need to take a natural disaster or a man-made disaster or disaster of whatever kind to create opportunities for us to recognise, to taste the pain of the world, to taste the pain in our communities, to taste the pain in the lives of the people we know and the people around us. It, doesn't, it shouldn't be taking some massive disaster. Then we start thinking, oh, there is pain. There is pain. The pain is evident all around us. That engagement actually can't, comes in our interactions, our lived experiences with family members, with supposed friends, our friends, um, our neighbours, our colleagues, in our immediate surroundings. But here's a question quick question for all of us, and it's an important question. Do people you engage with experience the presence of the kingdom of God in you when you engage with them? Let me say that again a bit more slowly, in slow motion. Now you are laughing. Okay. Okay, it's an important question. Do people you engage with, or do people that I, you and I engage with, 
experience the presence of the kingdom of God in you and me when you and I engage with them. Do they? Today, we have a wonderful opportunity to remember the work and ministry of Faith Acts. And I think the Faith Acts team are still in ACJC. Um, they might come back a bit later, and I think they will. Uh, they're going to share with us about some of the things that Faith Acts does, and uh, Chun Huan, who's our lay leader, will also be talking some of that. So enough for me at this time just to say that for us, uh, that as we prayerfully consider volunteering participation, our participation will give opportunity for you to care like God cares by bringing the kingdom of God, the presence and power of the kingdom of God within you into the lives of many, both young and old, who have very real and deep personal needs. It may not be obvious when you talk to them that a lot of smiles, smiles hide a lot of things. But as you get to know them, I think you will un un identify that there are real deep-seated and personal needs. But the other thing that we can learn today out of the text, I believe, is this. There is an invitation to participate in the Lord's mission. I think Moses was trying to communicate that. If you love the Lord, you will truly love the least of those around you, the fatherless, the widow, the stranger. Moses didn't want the people to forget that, that when God blesses them, suddenly the fatherless, the widow, and the stranger are forgotten or are out of sight, out of mind. So he put it there that they would remember these details long after he is gone. But look at how he motivates or invites them and now you to that love, okay? To participate in the Lord's mission. And he says this, Love the stranger, for you yourselves were strangers in the land of Egypt. Now, some of you again here are sitting and said, I've never been to Egypt, so that's totally not possible. Uh, yes, so, uh, okay. And that would be correct, okay, because this actually was written to ancient Israel. When they were in Egypt, they were strangers. They were aliens. They were considered foreigners in a foreign land. And the Egyptians, who began by treating them actually quite well, eventually mistreated them. But here's the thing. The Lord's heart is for the vulnerable and the broken. His unrelenting love for the outcast, the oppressed, or the forgotten. Why? Because these know the shame and the pain of being a stranger or strangers. Caring for the stranger is not just a nice thing to do. You know, it's something that, uh, it's not something that, you know, it's so poor thing. So it's a nice thing to do for them. Nor should it be something that the pastor, my pastor says, so I have to do law. And then I do right now, it's like I kept a badge of honour. Have you done this? Have you done this? Yes, yes, already done, already done. It shouldn't be that. And why? Because you see, it was actually required. It was required in Moses' time as he was writing it. Justice and protection for the stranger were built into Israel's laws. Though it would have been easy for an Israelite to take advantage of the stranger for personal gain, God forbade it. God knows the temptation of His people to look out first for ourselves, our me number one, our family, and for those like us, and how tempting it can be to distance ourselves or to push away even if not physically, metaphorically, to push away and be unconcerned with those who are unlike us. It was Tim Keller who, who wrote this. He says, It is striking to see how often God is introduced as the defender 
of these vulnerable groups. This is one of the main things God does in the world. God identifies with the powerless. He takes up their cause. The God of the Bible stood out from other gods of all other religions as God on the side of the powerless and giving, as God giving justice to the poor. But some of you might be asking, what does it mean to be poor? Jason the Ruchi suggests this. Poverty comes in many forms. Certainly, lacking material goods is a form of poverty, but lacking family and loved ones is also a form of poverty. Are you aware of that? Lacking family and loved ones is considered a form of poverty. Lacking skills to do work or lacking education is also a form of poverty. And in Singapore, I believe, you know, the education level, um, practically everybody is educated. But it's not like that in other parts of the world. It's not like that. There is real poverty in that area. Poverty also uh, is not just the absence of stuff, of material possessions. Poverty can be seen in the disposition of the soul. The disposition of the soul that is lived in brokenness, in hopelessness, in helplessness, and imprisonment. I think the deepest form, though, of poverty, it's when we lack any relationship with God. That is the deepest, most form of poverty. Where strangers are concerned, I think Singapore has done well um, in reaching out to strangers over the years. Um, and our churches, well, you know, God has blessed and we have grown. But here's something that I've observed as well. I've observed uh, that we have grown homogeneously. What do I mean by that? We have grown homogeneously because we are made up by people like us. Now, it was Dr. Tan Layong, who was a former missionary, and I think now he's, he's working with the National University of Singapore. He points to the fact uh, that, there is, that if there is a high number of foreigners in our land, and I think we all probably would agree there's a, a lot of foreigners in our land, then he asked the question, why are there not high numbers of foreigners in our churches? So he says, what's happened with COVID is that COVID has awakened us, apart from a multiple other things that COVID has surfaced, one of these things is, has awakened us to this stark reality that our churches are very homogeneous, maybe a bit too homogeneous. That there are plenty of foreigners in Singapore, but why aren't the foreigners in our churches? And he says, that we can't do much about it unless we rediscover God's love and God's love propels us. It gives us the mandate, it gives us the impetus to move outside beyond the church's walls, to move alongside these communities. It seems we now have missions in our backyard, but actually it is missions in our front yard. Why do I say that? Really, today, you do not have to go very far. You do not have to depart Singapore in order to do foreign missions. There are plenty of mission opportunities right here in Singapore. And again, just understand, I'm not knocking traditional missions the way we do traditional missions. Like God does call some people to go out to do traditional missions overseas in lands we really do need to hear the gospel message. But for many of us, uh, if we say we can't go, uh, there are plenty of opportunities here to do foreign missions. But let's now allow me to, to think about strangers. We, we think along the line of strangers, all right? Um, and strangers, not just foreigners. We're going to take it and draw some parallels, all right? 
strangers and, and that we can actually become strangers very easily in our everyday relationships, actually. We are close enough to being strangers all the time. You see, even when we come from the same culture, yet, and just let me say, okay, so many of us here are Chinese. In fact, the majority is Chinese. So let me use the Chinese, all right? We're Chinese. We come from the same culture. We come from the same culture. But, yet, our people who come from different backgrounds, we can be Chinese, we come from different backgrounds, we have come from different strata levels in society. Uh, we are people, there are people who are not like us, we come from different backgrounds, people who are not like us, people who don't think like us, and we, without verbalizing it, uh, we label them strangers or aliens, we exclude them from our groups, or we discriminate against them, we marginalize them, or we sideline them. These are strangers too. What are some of the groups that may be a bit more marginalized? I'm sure you can think of some. But just let me share a story, another story. Greg Paul who was the director of a sanctuary, a ministry to Toronto's poor and homeless. He shares a testimony of his experience in caring for a man who is dying of AIDS. Neil, he said, had deteriorated to a shell of his former self without strength or mobility. One day, Greg actually stopped by to visit Neil and he found Neil in a panic, struggling with his bedsheets after having soiled himself. Greg picked Neil up, he was that light, bathed him, cleaned his bed, dressed him, placed him back in the bed, and Neil quietly lay there against the pillows and allowed Greg to continue by taking his feet and then putting his feet and tucking them under the covers. Whilst doing that though, Greg noticed that one foot, one of Neil's foot, was still soiled. Getting a washcloth, Greg wiped that foot. As he did so, Greg says he was so struck by what he could only describe as a powerful revelation. In cradling Neil's foot, Greg's mind was filled with the image of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples at the Last Supper. And Greg said, he commented, this moment was what my whole time with Neil had been for. This was what it meant to be the presence of Christ, caring like God cares. Yet at the same time, Greg was also deeply touched by Neil's vulnerability. The words of Jesus were ringing, he says in his ears. I was a stranger. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. Whatever you did, whatever you did to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did for me. And Greg said, this also was the purpose of his time with Neil. He said, for the first time during the whole of our relationship, I saw Jesus in Neil. For the first time in our whole relationship, I saw Jesus in Neil. Neil. I saw Jesus in Neil, Jesus allowing me to clothe him and look after him by caring for his brother. Soon after that, Greg asked to pray for Neil. When the prayer was done, there was a very long pause. And actually, I think Greg thought Neil had gone to sleep or something. But then suddenly Neil 
whispered a prayer into the stillness of the room. And the words he spoke were words of blessing upon Greg. Neil knew he was dying. Yet, Greg said, he asked nothing for himself. He blessed me instead. A week after that, Neil was gone. You know, sometimes when we go out to minister, we ourselves are ministered to. So now I just want to close this time. I'm going to sing a song. People need the Lord, and I think some of you might be familiar with it. And if you are familiar with it, let me encourage you to sing along. Okay? People need the Lord. Every Every day they pass me by I can see it in their eyes Empty people filled with care Headed who knows where On they go through private pain Living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, he's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize People need the Lord. We are called to take His light to a world where wrong seems right. What could be too great a cost for sharing life with one who's lost? Through his love our hearts can feel All the griefs they bear They must hear the words of life Only we can share People need the Lord People need the Lord At the end of broken dreams He's the open door People need the Lord People need the Lord when will we realize that we must give our lives for people need the Lord? Yes, people need the Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And so, Lord, as we have sung these words, this is also the prayer of our hearts, recognizing, even as we recognize, that people need you, O oh Lord. That at the end of broken dreams, you are the one certain faithful door. 
And so, Lord, we pray you will grant us the grace to take your light to a world where wrong seems right. That you would give us the grace to know that there is no, it's not too great a cost to share life with one who's lost. Help us also, empower us to bring the words of life to different ones we will meet. We pray that the presence of your kingdom in us and the words of life that we do will give hope and encouragement to all the lives that we touch. We pray all of these in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hi.